Okay, good evening everybody. Good evening. Yeah, thanks for coming on uh, what's well, a pretty foggy night, isn't it? Uh, they didn't forecast that, I don't think. But uh, yeah, I'm glad you all got here. I did say, like, not normally, we have a few people perhaps who are coming late. Um, before we, we have monthly meetings and uh, in the winter half of the year, then we have field trips, some fantastic field trips in the summer half of the year, and everybody's welcome to that. And uh, we, do a, we do a long weekend, which hopefully COVID allowing. Um, we're going to do, get back and do our long weekend next year, which we're planning tentatively to go to South Wales. So uh, around the Pasali Mountains, you know, the, uh, the Stonehenge Triangle, all that sort of thing, and probably going over Robin Heath. In fact, he doesn't know it yet, but Robin's going to show us around. <laughs> but he doesn't know it yet. I just thought, wow, well, who, who better? Uh, if you want to join our email list uh, for people who aren't on it, Sue's got the little piece of paper there. And also, please so so join up to our Facebook page where you'll see more images and more events than we put in the newsletter because of space. And also you can post your own things on. So if you go to any funky sacred sites or anywhere nice, post it on our Wiltshire Dozer site. Um, you'd have to come via me, because we get a lot of weird people come on our site. Yeah. Oh no, they're, they're on your <laughs> side. <laughs> yeah, you, you would have to come via me first, so uh, naturally. But that's to protect the group, really, from this. Right, thanks for being patient. Maria. Yes. I think you'll all know Maria, and if you haven't heard Maria before, um, you're in for a treat. Um, the connection instantly that she has with us, of course, her father, Dennis, founded our group. So, um, and, uh, you know, so um, we're indebted to that, uh, if, if and nothing else. Uh, she's an author, researcher, what I like about Maria, she, she doesn't just go around sacred sites like a lot of people doing selfies and all that sort of thing you see on Facebook. She actually does original research, and anybody who does that always has my respect. She's an international speaker, tour guide, um, uh, a dowser, and uh, she, she did an article for our Sensing the Earth book, uh, which was absolutely amazing. All the uh, sites around Avery and how to douse and connect with Mother Earth. And I love the way you use the term Mother Earth quite a lot. And I didn't know that about you and so then. So I'm a, a kindred spirit, looking at the earth as, a, as being a conscious soul. So please give a warm welcome to Maria Wheatley. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming out on such an awful evening, isn't it? With thick thought, fog. Uh, but here we are. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to be showing you some of my new research uh, done on ancient sites such as Stonehenge and Silbury Hill. And I'm indebted to Richard Cardrew, a mathematician, and to David Webb, an engineer. So this is a real team effort work on looking into the ancient sites through new eyes. And we believe with the legacy of the ancestors have left behind us. And it is staggering. I don't know if you've heard of the night of the uh, high moon? Has anyone here heard of the night of the high moon? Ooh, you're going to like the high moon. Uh, so this is what it's focusing on. It's focusing on uh, the particular night of the high moon at uh, Stonehenge and then we'll be moving on to um, Silbury uh, Hill. So when we think about Stonehenge, we actually think about the sun, don't we? We think about the summer solstice and the alignment of the sun to the heel stone as viewed from the centre of Stonehenge. But uh, yeah, archaeoastronomers such as Clive Ruggles and many others say that is so inaccurate. It's a degree out for one. And in that famous 1969 book by Gerald Hawkins, who I'll be mentioning later on, his photographer stood two metres off the centre of the line to get the sun coming up, which you can find out through people, like I say, like Clive uh, Ruggles. So we're going to be looking at the exact alignments at Stonehenge, which we we'll see is to the moon and to a goddess cult uh, that is long, uh, long gone uh, at Stonehenge. Stonehenge phase one, as many of us will know, consisted of a henge bank, uh, which is unique in Great Britain because Stonehenge, the most famous henge of them all, isn't a henge because it's got the bank on the inside, the ditch on the outside, and a smaller bank on the outside of that. Whereas a henge like Avebury has the ditch on the inside and the bank on the outside. Why? I always ask those awkward questions to archaeologists, 
Why is that? Because they wanted to do it that way, was my reply from Wessex Archaeology. So I thought, no, I'm going to get my teeth into this because I want to know why the ancient ancestors did that. And like I say, it's uh, got one entrance in the northeast and the other in the south. And it had 56 blue stones going around, which according to Peter, you'll be going probably to Congo Dog and uh, Rossafellin, which are the beautiful bluestone outcrops uh, on the Preseli. And I used to live uh, not far from Robin Heath at uh, St. Dogmalls uh, on the Preseli Mountains when I was uh, a past hippie in my 20s. So we're at phase one. You've got all of these beautiful blue stones going around, highly polished, really, really polished, smooth to the touch. And I'm sure those that have, uh, love Avebury have felt the polished stone at Avebury, where you can put your face against it and it is so smooth, it's like velvet. These were like that, yeah? So they were uh, magnificent, they, uh, they really were. So this is what we're going to be looking at. The first phase, which was Neolithic, uh, Orthodox dating goes to around about 3100 BC, if you listen to Mike Parker Pearson and Mike Pitts. But personally, I think they're much older because I've studied with Lisa Brown at Oxford University and their mantra is this, if you find two pieces of carbon, and that's their holy grail, so you find two pieces of carbon in say uh, a stone hole, a stone socket, and then you put them through the dating process and you get 2500 BC or as they got 7500 BC, they choose the earlier date of 2500. 500, or the later day actually. So that's what they found here uh, in, in the socket. So this could be much, much older because the ice cap didn't come down uh, this far. So it would have been an amazing uh, monument. And as Robin Heath and many others point out, it was probably taken from uh, an earlier site in Wales, some of these blue stones anyway. So uh, they could have been in the existing monument, which seems highly, highly likely. And as Mike Parker Pearson recently put out, not just that stone circle, but probably uh, many others uh, besides. So the midpoint uh, cycle of the moon, uh, which I'll explain, this is exact at Stonehenge. Uh, every 18.61 years, the moon tends to be really high up north, doesn't she? Or she's really low down south, like that. So every 18 years, uh, Mother Moon does that. She goes like that in the winter, and she goes like that in the summer. But the midpoint between that, every nine years, uh, the moon appears exactly as she rises above the heel stone. And that is one of the most accurate uh, cycles at Stonehenge, as viewed from the center of Stonehenge phase one, or, or st Stonehenge phase two, three, and four. That is the, the accurate one. And it was Gerald Hawkins, who I mentioned earlier, back in the 60s, who noticed uh, one beautiful thing about this uh, cycle is that when it's at the winter solstice and you've got a full moon round about that time, she rises blood red in an eclipse above the heelstone. Last time I went to see that, it was really, really like tonight, foggy and cloudy, because it would have looked absolutely magnificent. So yeah, so this is, the, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at these cycles of the moon and how they could interact uh, with uh, Stonehenge, to see Stonehenge through the light of the moon and light effects at ancient sites. Because when uh, people say, you know, oh, you go to an ancient site and you see the sunrise, what are the effects of that? And that's what we're going to be uh, looking at uh, now. So the night of the high moon, it's the longest night of the moon's platonic cycle. And according to Gerald Hawkins, it happens every 19, 19 and 18 years. And it's opposite to the summer solstice, which is the longest day of the sun's annual cycle. Okay, it's a real point in time where it's the darkest time. 
And last time it was the moon's uh, longest night, I was at Avebury. And I was wondering who would turn up to see that, that alignment. And there was only three pe four people, three I invited, and another Steve Stack. He was the uh, Wiccan from Avebury. He figured out it was the, the longest night. And I got the shot of the moon on the longest night at Avebury. Uh, the only one to date and it was hilarious because the other guys they were all trying to take the shot of the moon coming up and the cameras won't work for them but I could go over being a, I feel being a woman uh, recognizing the moon and I was taking all the pictures for them because their cameras simply wouldn't work so it's the time of that point of the cycle of 18.61 years uh, where it is the darkest night and that was celebrated by our ancient ancestors at the alignment that uh, is in my book about Avebury, uh, which I saw uh, many, many years ago now. And this is what was happening at Stonehenge with the 56 blue stones. And that is a, a, a lunar number anyway, because if you add up 19, 19 and 18, it roughly adds up to about 56 or 59.99 or something. But Gerald Hawkins noticed that as well. So whenever you see these numbers, they represent a lunar number as well. And then he goes on and explains uh, that if you divide it and times it, you know, all these mathematicians, I'm a bit too right brain for all of that and couldn't remember it. But you can go into really uh, sensual uh, numbers game uh, with uh, the night of uh, the high moon and the number 56. So that's very uh, wise that our ancient ancestors chose those beautiful uh, stones uh, to the number 56. So we've got two questions so far. We've got why put the bank at Stonehenge on the inside? No other henge has that. And then why are henges built with these corners? Can you see? They always like that, aren't they? Why, why do they have corners on them? So uh, I asked um, a couple of the uh, uh, archaeologists from uh, Wessex, uh, Oxford, and Bath. If you're going to ask a question, ask it from the big boys. So I said, why do they have these here? Oh, would you, this is, this is the answer. They had a gang here and dug to there. Then another gang came along and they dug to there. Then another gang came along and dug to there. So, okay, so you've got lots of, could be clans, they said, it could be families. And somehow that just doesn't ring true, does it? It's like, you know, uh, my daughter Raven at the age of 10 could have come up with something better than that. But these are the first phases. But like I say, this is the opposite way around. Avebury is, is a true, true henge. Then you could say, uh, which I've said in uh, my Avebury book, uh, I can't remember when I wrote that, it was so long ago. Uh, but it can separate the sacred from the profane. That's a very common way of looking at uh, henges uh, so far. So you could say that. You could say, ah, if you look at particular earth energy patterns, it's because of that, maybe. Or is there something else that has gone by amiss for all of these years, which I think has. And also, I don't know if you've seen uh, the, the effects of other arcs. I mean, we've got Windmill Hill here, as I'm sure you'll recognize. Again, you always have these arcs. And you've got Robin Hood's Ball near Stonehenge, that's on military land. But you can see that they always deliberately include these arcs. And even Marden Henge, which is half the river uh, Avon, to all of the Henge banks, they're all deliberately done uh, to an arc. So I think that was the next question I wanted to answer. Okay, it's got Stonehenge phase one, it's got a ditch on the outside, bank on the inside, and why on earth do you have these arcs? And I just happened to be talking uh, one day to, uh, to a mathematician, actually, uh, in, in the pub at Avebury, and I had some pictures around and saying, Avebury's arc is just so beautiful, it's curvature, it's really beautiful, uh, the top one, and the bottom one kind of nicks around like that, and they're really very uh, appealing, especially like Mount Pleasant, which is under a car park these days, but again, you've got this beautiful dip uh, about there. So they're doing this for a reason, and it was like uh, I've always uh, said, in the ancient world, everything had meaning 
nothing was by chance. It really, really wasn't. So again, you know, I just like to ask the questions that uh, seem to go by uh, unnoticed uh, in a way, and especially when I'm around sort of other academics and um, mathematicians. So I was around uh, talking to a mathematician. He introduced me to another professor and said, we kind of like where you're going because I said, I think chalk is highly reflective for one. It's got massive reflective qualities. I was coming back quite late on a, on a tour bus uh, with some Americans a couple of uh, years ago, and I'm wired. I don't know if you are, Peter. You're probably far more like, far more cool than me. But, but I'm kind of like, like a bunny in the headlights thinking, oh, I've got to get them to Castle and Ball. And so I'm really, really wired uh, uh, on the bus. And I was noticing in the moonlight, as the, half the bus was asleep, in the moonlight, coming across White Sheet Hill, not far from Stourhead, everything suddenly lit up and as the moon came down there were these dark shafts that hit the hill and when it hit the hill it kind of bounced back out into this long line so I, I asked the driver momentarily stop he said why I said I want the toilet like that because I just wanted to go out and take some uh, photographs and what we uh, and the professor and I discovered was if you have these chalk white arcs, they can act as like a really gigantic lens that can produce an optical visual kind of a, a illusion, an actuality, in fact, which is called a caustic. And you can play with this at home with torches. I've got a massive uh, reconstruction of Avebury in my front room, whereas if you get a, a torch like this, you can figure out every single angle at any kind of... Moonrise is what, what they, they made me, actually, and thankfully let me keep it. So we were looking into this, and the, the caustic is a real curve, so that when light hits a, a, a corner bit, it can bounce back. Yeah, so you need a corner like that, or you need a side of a hill. Direct on, it will just give a shadow uh, effect. But a lot of the chalk, uh, I think, and this is like some reflective qualities like snow that it gives, uh, even in a really highly wooded area, the light will always shine through and, and create light and dark and light and dark, as we know when like, we walk home uh, and things. Now, the blue stones and the sarsens were highly polished at Stonehenge. And I think the chalk was highly polished. And we've done some experiments with chalk where you just take a little bit of kind of rough paper and then smooth paper like this, and it, it takes on a whole new form. And it can be really, really reflective. And just take a big chunk of uh, chalk, put it out into the garden, and watch what happens when, uh, when the moon hits it. You will see a bright line like this off, and especially if it's got that corner on it, which will cause uh, a caustic. So it could be, so what we're thinking now is what I said for my last Stonehenge uh, book. I don't think they were uh, going necessarily by day. The night was the most important and it was the night of the high moon and we're heading for that pretty soon. So um, here we have more shadows and even the moon is getting higher here. The other ones I showed you would be like a southerly. Uh, moonrise at its most extreme. Like I said, that would be when it's down there and it will be up here uh, in the north and that's heading now for the north, creating a really nice thinner shadow line. So you get a kind of thickness and a thinness, just like the, the sun produces uh, with shadows uh, as well. So it can act like a mirror, the arcs, and it can reflect a thin caustic piece of light that we have uh, experimented with. But you need requirements for that. You need the bank on the inside for one. You can't have it if it's the bank on the outside. And you need a chalk white floor. You can't have grass for this effect to happen. You just simply can't. So it's a case of then, how do you prove at Stonehenge in phase one and phase two, it had a chalk floor. Because, uh, for example, uh, it's about, you know, 300 and so feet wide. Avebury is about 1,088 feet wide. You can fit 10 stone hinges into Avebury, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, so where could I get a witness? And again, you all know about synchronicity, don't you? You know that if you kind of put it out there to a great spirit uh, and Mother Earth, they give you the clues back. 
And so uh, I just happened to be reading through uh, a load of uh, unpublished diaries of um, Guy Underwood and, um, uh, and Tom Graves. And it was their kind of unpublished stuff. And I thought, well, hang on, they're talking about somebody that was there at the very famous Atkinson excavation in 1959, both of them. And one was there. And I thought, wow, you know, that's really unprecedented because the only reports you'll ever hear about that excavation is from uh, Professor Richard Atkinson himself. And don't bear in mind with Richard Atkinson, like I often say, don't let the title professor fool you because he was not a good professor. Only in 2005 did they find the sheaf of the uh, dagger that belonged to the bush barrow find that he excavated back in the 50s. He had it in his house and then lent it to a university. So, I mean, things were getting lost with Richard Atkinson. And one thing about Stonehenge that I've kind of seen in my own uh, research is if you don't kind of let the energies go, they get obsessed. Yeah? <laughs> and they kind of like get really obsessed about Stonehenge or, or other, other sites. So anyway, so I thought I'll sit down and I'll read all of the witness notes from everybody there that happened to be uh, with Underwood and others on that day. One of them was very widely respected curator at Stonehenge. He was a tour guide for 25 years, and because of his long time at Stonehenge, they gave him a freebie with Richard Atkinson's Henge Bank Dig. So he, he was there, uh, like I say, and, and many others uh, besides. And what they said was very different to, to Atkinson. What the curator guide said was, it wasn't chalk rubble. It wasn't chalk block. Yeah. So you're, you're now saying, OK, if it's not chalk rubble, like we're led to believe, isn't it? They kind of, you know, put uh, chalk together or more likely chalk block, like it's Silbury Hill, isn't it? That's massive chalk block. Then what was it? And he said it was smooth to the touch and that it was made out of one piece of massive chalk not bits like Silbury Hill, almost like it was carved whole out of a dip. Anyway, so you had Atkinson on the one hand saying it was rubble. Earlier you had Hawley, Colonel Hawley, that did a dig at the turn of the last century, saying that he didn't know what it was anyway. So, and that was the only dig that they did. So the, all of the eyewitnesses disagreed with the archaeological report. So make of that what you will. But the, uh, the eyewitnesses uh, seem to be correct. So if we've got a, a, a chalk floor, uh, which they said that they saw, and if you've got a chalk bank that is smooth, which is what they said they saw, then you've got your white floor that can produce an acoustic beam with the angles when it hits those corner lines it could produce a, a, a thin beam of light and so the what they calculated was was the uh, length of the beam is half the radius of the henge and that would reach towards if you imagine a beam of light now when the moon is at its most northerly or southerly more likely it will put a caustic light right the way to where the later, 1,300 years later, Y holes would be. So it were, they could have dictated the place. Perhaps in a kind of memory of uh, a Stonehenge, they were saying we'll put, eventually put the last feature there where the caustic light beam could have uh, beamed to. So the Y holes are quite, uh, quite important uh, in that. So we've now got all of the criteria to make uh, literally a light show at Stonehenge at phase, phase one with uh, the, the beautiful chalk effects. Well, think about that colouring sequence alone. You've got the dark uh, blue stones and then you've got the white chalk bank. It's like a yin-yang colour mix now of uh, Eastern philosophy was their chosen colour design. They could have taken any stones, but they chose uh, the blue stones, which has uh, long been pointed out by authors like John Burke. They're three times more magnetic than any other stone, is his claim. Uh, in one of his uh, books about seed enhancement. So 
So if we say then that you can have these effects at Stonehenge, then, then what would it be? And like I say, I was, uh, the, the mathematicians calculated uh, this, uh, and uh, the model proves it very, very uh, correct. And we've chosen the moon's most northerly uh, moonrise for this, but I actually personally think it will be better at the most southerly. That's my uh, hunch, but that, this is what the guys are saying. They're saying it's uh, be the, the night of the high moon because of the number of stones, like I explained uh, earlier. And the moon rises, as I don't know if you've seen the moon rise at Stonehenge, it kind of comes up over Lark Hill military establishment. How poetic is that? And it comes up over uh, Lark Hill and then it will move to uh, due east because we're now in the winter. We're around the first full moon of the month of December uh, in this sequencing. So it's, been, it's, been, it's coming right, it's been up for some time, you know, it's like now the moon will be up for some time, but then when it moves to due east, you'll be now on one of those corners of, of, the, of the Henge Bank and uh, or a or the circular part uh, if it was completely uh, smooth and then it would cast uh, a beam of light down to where number one is probably it's anticipated through blue stones 34 and 35 that linear beam of light that would go to where uh, the y stones uh, would be in the future so what would be happening then and what would you be seeing at Stonehenge? It was much, much bigger than the Stonehenge today. You'd fit a lot of people into Stonehenge phase one. And as you may know from some of my earlier uh, work, uh, the, the people here were long skulled uh, in, in phase one. And I've just had permission from three universities now to photograph their skull collections, and I've got the femur bones. I've got the femur bones of the Bronze Age tall people and the femur bones of the short people. And once you have a femur bone, you can do the anticipated height. And that's uh, going to be quite uh, intriguing uh, in its own right. And, you know, it's, it's very humbling uh, being around uh, human remains of our ancestors. And it is by a wing and a prayer that, that I get in. I name dropped on the last university and I thought, I hope they don't phone. <laughs> I hope they don't phone because what am I going to say? But anyway, they didn't phone. I was just, you know, trying to be really cool, really cool. Uh, so I think these people had the long skulls in the Neolithic, uh, they were quite short, uh, the femur bones suggest that the men were no higher than five foot four and the women were about the size of Queen Nefertiti, four foot nine. So they were really quite, quite short. More than that, in our recent reconstruction, which will be around uh, in my next book, their faces were dramatically different. We tend to have quite wide faces here. We've put the uh, long-skulled people uh, next to the Bronze Age people. They were completely genetically different. I don't know if you've read the latest uh, genetics about, it was uh, issued a couple of months ago in British archaeology, where now they're saying categorically the Bronze Age people did not build Stonehenge. In fact, the Neolithic people didn't mix or intermarry for 500 years is the latest DNA. So these people, or the Bronze Age people, or both the peoples, were keeping separate for quite some time. But eventually they did uh, in, intermarry. And you can find that report online, uh, for, for example. It is very, very uh, intriguing. The other thing I think Oxford is keeping is that they're now seeing that the skulls are really thick and you only get that in very, very dark skin. So maybe these people were really dark skinned, is what I think, far darker than the Cheddar Man. Uh, and they, they're kind of knowing that. So the ancient Britons had this beautiful uh, kind of dark appearance, but maybe kind of reddish color hair uh, as well. So it's not all kind of, you know, uh, black, black hair. Uh, and, and very stunning uh, blue eyes is one model of a, a Mesolithic man, uh, Cheddar Man. 
So I think what was happening, you had this uh, high priestess, because now we're dealing with the, the moon, matriarchal societies, and that there would be a chosen uh, priestess who would be standing maybe in between those two blue stones, and so the caustic light would go on her and illuminate her momentarily. And the beauty about the caustic is, as the moon moves on, it will be suddenly in light, then bang, in darkness again. And we know this happens with the moon when we go to Kalanish, because it was the wonderful Margaret Curtis, and I was there in 2006 with Margaret Curtis. She's the leading authority on anything to do with Kalanish. And it's wonderful that women like myself and Margaret are discovering things about the Earth Mother and, and Sister and Sister Moon. And what Margaret Curtis noticed about Kalanish, and like I say, I was there to, to witness it some years ago with her, was by Kalanish. It's a kind of like a Celtic uh, cross in, in a way, beautiful stone circle, and you've got hill range like a sleeping beauty with her boobs and then her belly like that. It's beautiful. So you've got the sleeping beauty mountain range and you've got Kalanish here, but intriguingly, just by the, the center of the stone circle, you have a hillock here, yeah? So you've got a raised platform, a stage at Kalanish. And what Margaret said would happen, because she witnessed it in the 80s, was the moon dips and dives along the sleeping beauty as if awakening her. And it would come down and come up. Oh, and that was so magical to see. Because Pete, if Pete was there, it was like a lot of other people there. Pete, they were drumming like mad each time you saw the moon come up. It was amazing, the atmosphere. And there wasn't that many people there because uh, the, it wasn't so, uh, so known. And, uh, and Margaret talked us, you know, all uh, uh, through it. Then what she discovered in the moonlight was if there was a woman of average build doing this on the hillock, just like that, then as the moon came round from Sleeping Beauty, it would now be so low on the horizon of the uh, Kalanish more northern latitude, then it would be honeycombed, a beautiful, beautiful honeycomb. And then I would be in the moon. Not that I'm saying I'm such a high priestess, I'd be in the moon. But if I was, if I was like this, I'd be touching the edge of the moon, yeah, like this. So I'd be in the moon, the woman in the moon. And if that's not enough, what she discovered was if you stand in a little uh, part of Kalanish that doesn't look too important, then the atmospherics now are playing a major mirage against you. And my shadow would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and engulf the people there and then bang, back to dark again. So that's the drama that we have with the moon. So uh, uh, I'll be taking a group up there to, uh, to, to Kalanish. Going to have an international group uh, going up there. Um, like I say, I'm really fortunate that I, I met Margaret there because she's an incredible person, an amazing woman. She looked up at a lot of uh, other places in Kalanish as well. So we've got that drama going on in the Neolithic. It was like, use the atmospherics, use this, use that. Don't just go, oh, look, there's the moon going up. Oh, how nice is that? I think they were playing with the kind of theatre of it for magic, for magical, ritualistic uh, manifestations and things like that. So I envision that a woman was stood uh, in that caustic beam of light between those two stones, or it could have hit a stone. By the time 10.30 uh, comes along, then what would have happened uh, once more, the beam of light, not a line now, because you've got the station stone there, it could have illuminated the station stone. And if somebody had been stood there, they would have been uh, slightly illuminated for a short time uh, as well. And then the moon would move over right to fade where it says number three, quite early in the morning. It would be the last time you'd see a caustic on that bank, or maybe an hour and a half uh, later. Uh, there would have been another caustic line opposite the first one. So they're kind of creating a parallel. But 
the major uh, causeway at Stonehenge, phase one, I don't think is the northeast. I think it's the southern uh, side because at midnight or 1 p.m., and that depends where the full moon rose a few months before, it can be midnight or 1 a.m., it aligns perfectly with the uh, southern uh, entrance at that time. And like I say, you can check out, this is going to be in my forthcoming book, you can check out all of our calculations online, and we're giving you all of the places where you can uh, do this for yourself to check, uh, check that. So... I think the reason why the bank was on the inside was to use it for a caustic uh, beam effect. And I think it was about uh, the priestesses doing ritualistic magic uh, there. That's, uh, that's for sure. And even in Wiccan, it's like bringing down the moon in one right, isn't it? Uh, and so that's very uh, important. And uh, as Druid Mark will know from Avebury, there's a lot of people still today going to there at the full moon because there is something very magical uh, about that time. And so I think in the south, this was the monument where you would go to. Because like I say, the, in my last book, I calculated everything that was happening at Avebury, but it didn't have the drama that this, this phase one uh, would have had. The only course that you could probably get at Avebury would be on the Swindon side, uh, we, we've calculated. But that, is, that would be very tentative and it would be very faint because of the distances involved with, with the diameter of, of Avebury. Uh, but, you know, we can't rule things out, but uh, I think it's highly uh, unlikely. So I think the, in the South, this is where people went. And I don't think it was us and them, the Scots and the English. I don't think that at all, because we know through Parker Pearson's analysis of Durrington Walls that you had Aberdeen cattle coming down. So I think it was a stages of seeing these events at, at different places and... Even, you know, Egyptians would have come uh, over. We found uh, Egyptian artifacts. Uh, people from the Baltic were trading here in amber. That was the bling that they liked to wear in the Bronze Age. Apart from they loved black jewellery. Jet was the, uh, the main bling currency. And I think, we're talking about the, the high priestesses as well. Uh, the heel stone originally, in phase one, they found Neolithic pottery beneath there, according to Mike Pitts in Henge World. Uh, so that can be dated uh, to the Neolithic. It had this beautiful circular uh, chalk white. So they were doing chalk white here. All of this was chalk white. Uh, ring round here. So they dug this out, instantly packed it with chalk to create a circular uh, chalk effect around there. So they were doing these, uh, these chalk effects. So I think that was the enclosure where maybe the priestesses would start. Uh, and this is one of Colonel Hawley's uh, ex excavations with uh, a Bronze Age much later barrow uh, in the background. So we know that they were dealing with chalk like this. Why just dig that out and make a circle of it? I think that represented the full moon as well. Uh, and again, that would have had slightly more effective uh, chalk effects. And look how it is in the bedrock there. That's solid chalk bedrock. Uh, you know, you'd expect that much, much further down, but that was part of that uh, enclosure. Uh, say some of the eyewitnesses that went there. That's not rubble. And when we come to the later Stonehenge, uh, known as Stonehenge Phase 2 and Phase 3, uh, we have the Sarsen Stone Circle. Uh, as we know, the 30 lintel stone circle with uh, the trilithons on the inside. Uh, and that's how a uh, spoon-fed Stonehenge looks. And then we have the, the moon rises and the summer solstice. And you can see, even in Phase 2, even in phase two, when they took out all of the blue stones, don't want that stone circle, we're going to do it like this now. We're going to import the, the beautiful big sarsens from Westwoods, it's known now. It's still more moon than anything else at Stonehenge. We've got the minor northern moonrise, the lunar standstill I showed you earlier above the heel stone. And can you see the distance that the midsummer sun, that's the lighter circle, that's how off it is. And this is by Aubrey Bull, actually. This isn't me trying to make the glove fit. This is uh, from Aubrey Bull's book, the late Aubrey Bull, 
uh, great stone circles. So you could uh, check that in there. And these are all his alignments. And even he says back in the day that this was a, a lunar uh, stone circle and not an accurate sunrise at all. So that's Stonehenge uh, as part of my vision of what was happening in the Neolithic, being led by the long-skulled uh, priestesses. And the other thing that I find a high irritant, as I'm sure Pete, Sue, and you all do, is how the ancients portrayed what the people were wearing. You know, uh, like uh, animal skin on skins with disheveled hair, go anywhere else in the ancient world. And the Assyrians, do you see how the Assyrians do their hair? With all of those beautiful plaits and things. And then they're saying, oh, you know, that's how, how they dress. And you see kids' books. Well, when I was uh, looking uh, at Oxford of how people did textiles uh, back then, the, the finest textile was about the same thickness as a coarse woman's hair. So that's that. That was how fine their textiles were, yeah? So you can remove that kind of whole, I, I hate that, uh, <laughs> a vision. And uh, I know Miles, who's doing the film in here, knows Thomas Sheridan from AV. He's a very outspoken uh, person, Thomas Sheridan. I don't know if any of you know Thomas Sheridan? But anyway, I did Megalithic Odyssey with him and a very maverick guy, more maverick than Miles, can that be? Yes. Uh, called uh, James Swagger, and we were doing a thing at um, Caramore, a site in Ireland, and I remember Thomas getting so angry with how the average guide was describing what they were looking like. He said, go keep selling your uh, plastic pixies with uh, a lot of uh, swearing in between. It was hilarious. But now we're going to turn our attention to Silbury Hill because Silbury Hill is so local, obviously. We've all been, uh, we've all been to uh, Silbury Hill time and time again. And it is quite a, an intriguing monument. And we've got the pyramid uh, on the other side, Captain Gold is how it's often been described, smoothed off with beautiful limestone. And it's on a limestone plateau as well. So, so the whole of the pyramid is on, on a plateau uh, of limestone. And Silby kind of reflects that. And the only kind of image we can have come close is when, again, we use snow to describe uh, this type of monument. And so that's why it's there. But it, it's on a chalk plateau as well. And that gives certain effects when the sun or the moon crosses the horizon line, if it's near a fault line. Uh, so that, that could charge uh, the monument up by, by itself. So what we're going to uh, be looking at, because I want to speed this up, because uh, Miles and I think we have found something out about uh, an ancient site around here, which is very controversial. You wouldn't expect anything else from Miles. Uh, lighting up the dark. Now, I was with uh, an engineer, uh, David, uh, and we went up to Silbury Hill uh, on a series of occasions to check the electrostatic field discharge. I was then interested in Dave, um, John Burke's work on seed enhancement, and I've kind of been doing some uh, work on that. But that's why I was there. I was wanting to check out what a previous author had done. And then we went up there with his very expensive uh, equipment. And when we got to, we did a control at the bottom and a control here. And it's really boring in the control, so we're over the other side. Normal electrostatic field. Now, if you go six foot uh, up, you will, the electrostatic field will naturally change anyway. And the electrostatic field changes if you had cloud cover as well. So you have these natural effects. When you start to build quite high, you get more types of uh, uh, happenings uh, occurring that are described. Now, so when we went to the top, uh, we got 20,000 DC volts that instantly blew the equipment. So we had to go back down, fiddle the equipment, go back up again because he said, my equipment failed, my equipment failed. And I actually say, you sure that's not Silbury? <laughs> No, the equipment failed. Down the up, up Silbury uh, again, uh, back of the knees hurting. And same thing happened again. The equipment uh, just blew again. 
And so he's thinking, now something is happening. This isn't my equipment. He said, but we're going to come back one month later and we're going to check that it is 20,000 volts. This is ridiculous. Uh, and we went back and it was 20,000 volts again. So that is happening. More inclined to be towards the full moon. Uh, it does drop on, on different lunar phases. And obviously we haven't done a whole year there, but you could get these peaks through various different months. And we can see what's called uh, an electrostatic discharge, uh, which is commonly seen as like lightning coming out. And, and you can often hear an electrostatic field discharge by if you walk under pylons and you can sometimes hear a crackle, can't you? That's the electrostatic field again discharging. And uh, what we think is, is going on, here's how you get the electrostatic charges. Now, my late father pointed out, oh, God, it must be 25 years, 30 years ago uh, now, and I published about 15 years, years ago, is we, he calculated through looking at the chalk and then earth and uh, the different layering system you get at uh, Silbury Hill, it's more than likely to be an organ accumulator. And that's widely uh, known now about a lot of mounds, even the Ohio mounds. And I went to the Toltec mounds in Arkansas. They're, they're very similar uh, to that. So you've got this layering effect of organic and inorganic. That's on the inside of Silbury. And then it's kind of capped, if you will, by massive chalk blocks that make it look like a 50 piece like that and there's lots of um, you know diagrams uh, on the internet uh, about that and, and that would have created some say a spiral walkway around uh, Silbury is, is highly likely but what we're saying is like the Great Pyramid if you put copper which is probably it's a chalcolithic monument that's the copper age and it just drew weeks over from the chalcolithic to the bronze age so there was a lot of copper being uh, exchanged uh, in this area and by the mid bronze age there was pre-coinage and that's uh, i found this uh avery this is a pre-coinage uh, uh, bronze uh, age coin money coin so we have a lot of uh trade in copper and, and bronze. So it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that a copper capstone could have been placed on the summit of Silbury Hill. Because what we're seeing today is the vestiges of it. We're seeing that the Normans came along, sliced it off, didn't they, uh, as it were, uh, and had a lookout that at one point, uh, some archaeologists argue. So it has been tampered, and originally it is thought to be much more mound-like at the top, and we think that if you put a, a copper there, then it could start to uh, conduct uh, and discharge. And I had a fantastic picture of uh, what somebody took at Silbury Hill with this discharge of blue light, but he has banned me talking about it and showing the picture, which is uh, most unfortunate because he caught it at the, at the full moon. But for personal reasons, I won't go into. <laughs> uh, banned, aren't I? Uh, so, but we've, we've caught that, well he caught it on, uh, on camera, so we think it does still discharge, but not to the equivalent it did in the uh, late Bronze Age, because I think you would have been maintaining this monument, it would have been white, obviously, it would have been chalk white, it would have had the copper on the top, the layering effect you have to have like that, then the beauty of it would, it could have glow, had a glow around the top, not the sides, just uh, on the top of this blue uh, electrostatic field uh, discharge. Uh, and we feel that when those surges that we measured of 20,000 DC volts occur, boom, that's when you get the discharge, just like you get that at pylons uh, today that have to discharge. So I think you could, you could have literally seen Silbury for miles uh, and miles uh, uh, away. And this is where, Miles, do you want to, to come up? Uh, yeah. Yeah, OK. Well, this is Miles Johnson as, uh, oh, from, Miles the, Johnson. from the Basis Project. Uh, and many people here... Deplatformed on YouTube. Deplatformed on YouTube for, for fake, very uh, serious, fake news. Very, very awful. <laughs> uh, same as Kerry. But what you're talking about here is, is high static field stresses, which are indications of dimensional rip. 
and that's where a lot of these forts are. And um, there's other factors which you, I'm not too sure what you want to be to talk about. <laughs> we're going to be talking about uh, Fosbury Camp, Miles, where, with your uh, investigation into that, because it's quite important. What is going on about our ancient sites here today? Very simply, the Ministry of Defence says about UFOs, they are of no defence significance. That's not because they don't exist, it's because they are so integrally involved with the Ministry of Defence, it is of no defence significance. So there's a one or two telltale signs which you can see. Uh, a, a lot of very important military bases are beside these ancient forts. And those ancient forts are there because of our forefathers were able to, well, not, they're there for various reasons. But sometimes secrets are held in plain sight. And if you look carefully, you can see the signatures of something else, which is everything's deep underneath. And uh, without giving away too many signatures, there are telltale signs which we find, A, we couldn't find it, and B, we were actually drawn to it. So we, the sat -nav brought us one side, the sat -nav brought us the other side, and they brought us up a, a valley. I can't actually quite see it. It's on the this, other side, Mark. This side or that side? Uh, that's on the map. Uh, no, incidentally, I'll just say, so Fosbury Camp is around 600 um, uh, BC, and it was, no, was non-defensive. And if you go onto the English Heritage uh, website, you will find that the, the, they do register some buildings uh, down there. And this is in between two valleys. And like Miles said, I actually said to Miles when we go out for our jollies, you're going in the wrong direction, Miles. And then he just carries on anyway. So I actually well, said we should have stopped <coughs> up there, there but we went on. Uh, Stone site where you walked past it twice. <laughs> the important thing is that we've taken some photographs. So the important thing is that the Ministry of Defence has a number of um, designs for buildings which are in plain sight but are of civilian use. And like everything in the Ministry of Defence and NATO and all the rest of it, they have about a 15 digit NATO code and they are identical and they have certain characteristics to look and sort of fade into the reality of normal everyday life. When they don't, they're, when they have, they're trying to sort of display uh, normality, but when normality is actually disturbed or actually isn't actually normal, that's a whistle blow to something else which is, which is happening. So the long and short of it is there's a normal farm there doing normal things, but there are a number of military signatures in the area. And I was drawn there in the summer looking for a crop circle. Uh, and again, there are another, a number of signatures, which I'll just mention, which start knocking things off on the tick box. So the long and short of it is, it's completely obscured if nobody would ever see what's going on in that area, if there was something going on in that area. And I'm suggesting there's something very deep and uh, uh, big happening deep underneath, and there are arrivals there, which are then brought in and brought out to go places which are maybe not from around here. And incidentally, just to you know, incur here, I mean, I'm open-minded, but I'm not a Muppet, so I said to Miles, okay, I'll, I'll go along and I'll check, uh, check this out. Not another underground base, Miles. Secret this was underground. Secret underground base. That uh, isn't a secret, because we know about it. Uh, but it was something very strange because, like Miles said, the military make houses to a particular order to put in front of a normal building, don't they? Nobody was living in, in this house. Next door to it was another building with a conference room. Uh, that wasn't a woman's dining room. It was a conference room with uh, loads of chairs with a keep out uh, notice on, on the door as well. But it was just a normal farm. Just a normal it? farm, nothing happening here. Nothing happening except here. Except a little sign about this sign saying, saying prime. But it's just it's got a lot of number a lot of alarm bells and there are there's a lot of stuff happening in Farnborough. Uh, Farnborough, uh, the, the Marconi defense was compromised way back in the 70s. Eyewitnesses saw the ETs just walk in, do what they want, and now everything's happy, happy, slappy. Of everything is is sort of normal, and that's where they held their recent space conference. There actually, with a lot of people in Farnborough. Uh, Farnborough basically is a big fat. Area 51, and there are other facilities around it which are being modified, and uh, that's got me. Have I annoyed people? 
Uh, yeah. So yeah, fascinated. that's an indication. It's the other, the other thing, point about it is that when you're going on these sites, you're, you're looking at high mathematical technology using static field stresses and um, organ type devices. And, and the, or, the Silbury Hill is a classic example of a big organ bubble, which uh, the new science of advancing uh, Wilhelm Reich's technologies gives us straight back into what Silbury Hill is, including high static fields uh, involved with that. So when you see little static fields and 20,000 volts and stuff, that's part of the intrinsic way that the science works. So from an electrical point of view, but this is all about dimensional stress, which gives you gateways to other places. And we think Fosbury is one of them because it's in such a steep valley. I mean, these photographs just do not give it credit. Uh, and they're, they're huge. So anything that is coming in or going out or walking in or walking out uh, of that valley, nobody for miles around would see. You will not see. see anything happening there. And likewise, in, near Golden Ball Hill, you can land stuff on that. Nobody will see what's going on up there except a couple of people you well know did. Yeah, I know. So this is an um, evidence of a secret space program in plain sight. And I'll be doing a conference on that hopefully in April uh, 2022. We have uh, Julie Phelps, who's, who's complained about how boring it is on the RAF bases on Mars. <laughs> I believe that. Yeah, so well, what the, our point is, you have these ancient sites, there's, there's Fosbury there, and you have this strange activity going around. Now, on the English Heritage website, you can see those buildings are clearly there. Not the military ones, because uh, there are military buildings there, but you buy a map, which is what we did. We got an old-fashioned map, and there are no buildings anywhere uh, near that farm. The farm isn't even on the map, uh, literally. And uh, when, uh, in kind of energetic terms, uh, it is really very, very uh, strange energy there. When you start to kind of walk down, we got out of um, the car and we started to walk all the way down through, through the valley. And it's sort of like a kind of neutral kind of but high energy. It's very, very strange. The only time I can honestly say I experienced energy like that was... I was on uh, Vancouver Island and uh, they were doing uh, investigations into um, Catherine Maltwood. Catherine Maltwood, they think now, she was the design of the Glastonbury Zodiac. Well, she, was the, she discovered, rather, the Glastonbury Zodiac some, uh, some time ago now. Uh, and she went to Vancouver Island and she took the holy thorn there and she lived not far from Alistair Crowley and there was all these things going on and they think there was this huge uh, zodiac uh, on Vancouver Island. And when you look at Vancouver Island, you're now looking at the Cascade Mountains and the Cascade Mountains is where the first UFO was seen by uh, Arnold. Was it who? Arnold, someone Arnold Miles uh, saw the first UFO? I can't think of Arnold, yeah, definitely Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely Arnold. Uh, and, but the, you know, he coined the phrase uh, flying uh, saucer. And it's just not far. And part of that zodiac, uh, akin to Glastonbury zodiac on Vancouver Island, you have this massive Masonic graveyard. Mm -hmm. It's all black and white. It is a huge anomaly on, on the island. And, if you, if you, and they got steps up to the graves like this, with normally like an obelisk is, is quite common, although you get other motifs. And then when people were saying they stood on them, they felt they were being sucked down like that, instantly kind of sucked down into uh, the, the grave, you know, a bit like a, like a vampire as it were. And that's what I felt there. I felt like it was being sort of uh, sucked down uh, like that, and we had uh, had a long walk round. So for for me, like I say, I went there with an open mind, thinking I I don't know about this. You know, I just I'm just going to have a walk around Fosbury uh, camp. You know, but uh, it does seem, and we went back there as well to sort of reinvestigate and remounts and see uh, even more of the. Uh, World War, uh, Second World War buildings, and like I say, these strange uh, conference rooms. And when I did a program with the uh, UFO hunters, uh, which is still uh, online now, they're really lovely, lovely bunch of guys. 
and uh, we were doing about vortex energy at Stonehenge and it's like they've always uh, said wherever you get an ancient site you get a vortex you get the military yeah, involvement that stands to reason you get all of that criteria uh, going on whether it's Sedona in, in America or even you know uh, closer closer to home so we feel that there is something very strange going on uh, beneath our feet uh, here. So if you do want to investigate it yourself, carry on through the village of Fosbury uh, for about two, two miles or three miles, isn't it? And then you'll come to a no-through road uh, on, on the right and go down there and carry on down the lane. Then you'll have a no-entry uh, sign, park there. And, and start to walk and investigate uh, the building. Yeah, I mean, th this is uh, this is Fosby Camp here. You often get crop circles around them. I remember going there with Dr. Simeon Hine uh, to, to have, a, have a look at them. And it's a really big one. You can see the dew ponds uh, on top. At the moment, they've got cattle, uh, cattle in it. Uh, and Reg Presley of, of the Trogs, who did a lot of paranormal investigations, some of the worst uh, paranormal entities come from Fosbury. Uh, which, you know, people uh, like Miles and other investigators think, you know, you can have the walk-ins, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, coming through. It's not my uh, realm of investigation, but, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's worthy nonetheless. And uh, this is kind of the valley, and uh, you can't take a vehicle uh, beyond that point, but it is a bit of a bridle way that you can walk through uh, there. And like I say, it's not my... Uh, line of inquiry but I thought it's something I think we can all kind of look out for. Uh, what I do with skin wipers and get a picture of your, your, your beautiful hair. Reflecting. It's quite a distance through here. Yeah, because we have to go along here in quite some way, because we're literally going back on ourselves, aren't we? Yeah. The sign that we use. Uh, I think we can technically go into Hampshire. Yeah, we're, we're right on the border here, that's for we sure. We Hampshire, we go. Hampshire. Am I or man? Was it the Hampshire Regiment? Hmm. I know the Wiltshire Road are absolutely ghastly. Oh. Get a picture of the, the Connaught, Connaught Park, Park, one mile. Connaught. 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 This is where it starts to change energetically, yeah, doesn't that. it? I think just further on up when we stopped. Can you remember where we stopped yeah. last time? Because we yeah. thought we were lost. We're curving round quite a lot here now. The sun's off to the left. 
so we're turning right west on this. That was it, it was around here where it starts to get very... The sun's now on our left and that's all covered birds, this is it. This is it. up very green since we were here. It was yeah. all clouds. That's the rain over the weekend. Yeah. And this is where it starts to get really strange, I think, energetically. It's the uh, dimensional hour. The dimensions are shifting. But that fort should be up there. Yeah. Obviously, there's... there's that road keeps going. You can see the road up there. It goes right to the top. Does it? Yeah. Or that hill. So when it says no access to vehicles, that road keeps going. Or there is a road up there. You can see. Oh yeah, you, see you that. can see it. Yeah. Unless that's the road on the other side of the hill. Maybe look on a map. But there's nowhere to turn here. Once you're on this road, you're on. Up there, the fort might be. It up is, the, right. the fort is on our right. That's it, there. Yeah, that's Fosbury. That's Fosbury Camp. Iron Age ceremonial centre. It's called a hill fort. Well, it's not a hill fort. Is there anywhere we can sort of like walk across to that? Hmm. No, it's on private land. Right, do you want, want to film these buildings, isn't it? Yeah. No visitors. That's been put there. Was that not been added up? No, I think that was there last time. So we've got we no... Drive slowly, drive slowly. Okay. No vehicles. But it has the walk. There is a walk. I mean, that is a walking... Thing, so which means why don't we just drop the car here and walk along? What through there? Yeah, those are the rights of way. Okay, then we'll do that. Right, we just take a look. That's false break. There we go. So, do you want to explain why we're here? Yeah, I'll just pop my camera down. You don't know how to use that camera, do you? I do know how to use the camera. What a cheek. Well, today I'm with Miles Johnston from the Basis Project. Um, we came here about a week ago quite by accident because we were looking for an ancient Iron Age hill fort called Fosbury Camp. And Fosbury Camp is just over there and the sat nav brought us to this location and we came in through this road and it changed energetically speaking from one part of the road to another now this road says it's a no through road it has really strange energy especially uh, further on up there and it's like being in a valley and as miles pointed out just over here we have some military buildings and Miles is convinced that this is an underground base that could link to Dallas. Is that Dallas, Texas? Dallas, Texas. J.R. Ewing? I think so. Yeehaw! <laughs> could you do that again? I didn't get a proper size. <laughs> NATO spec concrete prefab chimney.
Hope you get you on summer scales here. <laughs> there, right there. Hello, Mr. Cockroll. You gonna strike your staff when you walk past? How are you doing? How are you doing? Are you guarding the place? That's free range. Yeah. Ah, she can go past then. And scum farmers. There it is. Well, here we are at the outside perimeter of the secret underground alien base. And here we are walking into the underground base alien fake reality. And there's a thickness as you just walk past here. Yes, it does change completely the energy in this direction to the energy in this direction. And as Miles has just pointed out, the light changes, the frequency changes, the energy changes. It's like a pressure change like walking pressure. from here to here. And this isn't actually the road. I think the road goes the whole way up to the top. We're actually on this bridleway thing here, so we're just having a nice walk. Yes. Amongst the alien bases. <laughs> yep. Desolate ploughed field with an optical illusion effect of closeness yet distant. I think the other thing is that this is not just an ordinary farm road you know, doing trees every so often. And those are the buildings up there that we aren't meant to see. Maybe that's where the, uh, where the feeders are. Those are the buildings I saw from above during the summer. There it is. That's the military bases up there. And you've got a bird of prey flying up there. Yes. What indications then is it for a military base up there? Well, I reckon. Well, there are probably just somebody in a Range Rover. Heavy tires go up there, that's why it's maintained. There's obviously something up there. They don't want anybody to go up to see. No. Private. All right, so uh, sales at keeper's choice. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. I think that's what it is, it's for the Beatons. Comment. There's comment about this area here, it's just where they do the feeding. Yeah, Feed. this, this area uh, here seems to be associated with shooting. You've got a feeder over there, you've got a beta marking point over there. And again, we've got feeders over there. But this is really uh, where the energy seems so much different. So we're going to go back. We're going to go back to the point where the energy was at its strongest and most strangest. And it was very peculiar because as Miles uh, Johnston will tell you, I don't buy into a lot of stuff quite, quite easily. But when I experienced the energy for myself, that's when I thought possibly something is of worth and merit here. And 
good enough for investigation. And that's why I came back. It's because I've been interacting with Earth energies and ley lines for many, many decades now. And something is strange about this location. And that's where we're going to go next. Uh, Maria Wheatley, uh, as this road clearly continues, are you basically saying you're scared shitless and don't want to go any further? You don't have to answer that question, but failure to do so will be viewed most suspiciously. Well, I think it's better uh, energy heading away from where we first were. That's what I think. So I think when we came in and there was that strange valley, and first of all, when we turned that corner, when we didn't know where we were going, we were just being led by the sat-nav to the ancient site called Fosbury Camp, then that's when we both realised something strange was occurring. And you could clearly sense and feel and perceive something was different down this seemingly no-through road, uh, an innocent no-through road leading to a farm, but that's clearly n maybe not the case. Is that a Busty Taylor triple nod? <laughs> Don't say that. No way. That's a Maria flick of the hair nod. Whoa. <laughs> the thing about the, the Moon's Metonic cycle, it's rare. It's every nine years for the midpoint, it's every 18.61 years where the moon is high or low. So I think that's a massive point for where women's powers and Gaia's power has a sudden surge. And for all of the, the feminine earth energies and the feminine deep waters uh, as well, I think that's a time when it is really going to, we're going to all feel a massive reboot. Uh, around that time. And it'll go on for quite some time through those months as well. So if you get one bad month at Kalani, stay there for two and you might see the moon come round uh, through the, through the um, stone circle there. So uh, it is, it will go on for about three or four months so we can prepare ourselves and, uh, and have uh, some really big rituals at that time, mm -hmm. make magic happen. Any questions or comments? The next high uh, well, it will start around about 2024, uh, and it's where you are and which one you want to see, whether you want to see it low or whether you want to see it high. So the most spectacular, I would say, would be uh, the southern, because it's very low on the horizon, it, it won't rise high. And that's where if the more northern that you go, the more honeycombed it's going to be. And honestly, when you see that moon rise, and it's massive, it's massive. You, you haven't seen anything like it. It's massive, and it's yellow. Uh, and it goes around Sleeping Beauty like this. It is something very special. So inevitably, does it have to coincide with the super moon sometimes? Uh, occasionally, but even last time uh, when I went there to, to see it, and like I say, there was only a handful of people there. I think this time it's going to be a bit bigger, but uh, it was still, you know, uh, absolutely incredible. And it was, I saw it for the two months on the trot. It was lovely. So, 2024, which month would that be? Again, it depends where, where you are, where you want to see it. So if you're in the north, then maybe uh, because, you know, you might not like midges and things like that. So you might want to go to see it early on in the May. Okay. Yeah, but you could see it uh, further on. But then, it, you know, it's, I would say go for May and then that might be uh, a, nice, a nice time. Uh, to do it because I've been there at the Ring of Brodka for uh, Midsummer Sunrise and that's very midgy at that time. 2024, that's about the time, as I, as I remember, about the time of the next solar maximum as well, 24 to 25, 26, 27, when the sun is going to be really active. That's really going to be. Yeah, and same with the moon, it'll be over that time span uh, as well. It's just when you want to pick it to what you particular point you want to be at. That, that's, that's the thing. It sounds like a real magical time point around that time. The solar maximum and the moon high and the total eclipse of the sun from Europe in 2026. Oh, that's a big I mean, build that's up. Like, that's, that's where I'm going to be in Spain, July 2026. So uh, that sounds like a real special time. Mm, I think it's a real, real big build up for change. A chat there, please, hand up. 
Oh, yeah. um, did you refer to Silbury Hill as being organ like? Yeah. Is that because of, I'm just thinking about my way of how I perceive organ. Is it crystal in the sedimentary rock or is it the way it's, the, the materials are brought in and it was constructed? Yes, it's in the yeah, it's in kind of the chalk and the mole bits uh, that had uh, like crystal effects in. You've got other authors like John Cowie that said it was uh, capped off with some limestone, like at the uh, pyramids. Although there's not that much limestone has been dug up, but you know when David Fields and people do their excavations there and. Um, uh, Jim Leary, uh, I think it was, uh, they're not looking for that. Uh, and they have their Pacific bits. And when they went into Silbury Hill and they did the old surface level, they marked all the old surface level, and I took pictures when I was in there uh, of that, then you can see there's uh, some crystalline uh, energies uh, in there. And at the bottom of most mounds, when you go to Ohio and places, they've got mica uh, at the bottom as well. Do you see any difference in surrounding weather as a result? Yes, I mean that's that's the, the other thing because uh, it's affected very much by the weather itself, the electrostatic field. So you're going to get more electrostatic discharge when there's clouds, but at the same time um, it's uh, postulated that the two can be worked together to make weather modification as Reich went on to do, didn't he, with his cloud busting, uh, which was... Essentially, it's a stepped capacitor with, ins with layers of conductors mm -hmm. and insulations, yeah. which jumps up the energy and the frequencies then change by the actual angle of the, the capacitors. Mm -hmm. So that's how you get like 20,000 volts from it. Yeah. The same principles used in TV sets to get the high voltage from the small voltage. So you mentioned Reich and the ultrasound and stone energies. Yeah. Micro, yeah, and they found mica at uh, Northern Inner Circle uh, as well. So, so that's the uh, you know you you do find that uh, uh, as a coincidence. Like Miles say, it's a capacitor, uh, and like I say, it's a real shame. I can't show you that photograph. When, but when we're not filming, not that I'm going to, I won't show it. Um, That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> when you're talking about um, sight lines as a Kalamish, um, with regards to positions to view, with regards to Silbury, to witness the uh, phenomena happening there, what is there, obviously West Kenya you can see Silbury from there, but is there any sort of um, sight positions to be at for witnessing events? Yes, the engineer did calculate uh, that, and you've got uh, Waden Hill on the other side, haven't you? When you walk down, you know, following the dry riverbed sometimes of the Winterbourne, then if you're up, up that part of the slope, that's uh, the, the best angle uh, he's calculated. And also there as well, when we did some more tests, uh, that seems to generate an electrostatic field anomaly. So we were thinking, I wonder if that's where people naturally felt the electrostatic field. So they viewed the electrostatic field from there is, is one way of thinking and one interpretation at least. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. you mentioned uh, the more elongated heads of our forefathers, if you like. Um, where do we have evidence of them in, or was it Pitt Rivers Museum or? But, but Pitt Rivers, uh, uh, he excavated a lot of the Bronze Age around Dorset and elsewhere. But the, yeah, I photographed the elongated skulls. They're, they're, they're really, really very, very uh, long. Uh, and the longest that I found to date uh, is from Yorkshire. They seem to be very, very elongated and, like I say, very narrow uh, as well. And, and their bones are very kind of uh, robust, but they're, they're very short. They, do they have different suture lines? Yes, they tend to not have uh, the main one that we have. They tend to have two, one there and one there, and they tend to lack that one that goes down there. Just like Brian Forster points out in the Paracas elongated skulls, which, uh, which are the cone heads. So like I say, you know, I've, I photographed them and had good fortune after lockdown 
to uh, photograph some more, but this time with the femur bone. You, you need the femur bone to, to have the height uh, of them. So that, that's what I've got. I've got the tall Bronze Age people that Colt Hoare talked about, uh, for their femur bone, and the, compare that then to the Neolithic. Uh, and the whole kind of build. And what they wore and everything was quite different as well. But these would have been travellers as opposed to um, indigenous? No, these would have been the, the, literally the ancient Britons. I was yeah. DNA results on any of these yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's all online. That they, they've done massive from Oxford, uh, the latest, and that's what they're saying, that the, they don't call them the elongated, skulled people of Stonehenge like I do, and, and Avebury in places. Uh, they say the ancient Britons. That's their term, the Neolithic or the ancient Britons, but they definitely had long skulls. I was shown my tutor at Oxford when I was doing a um, three-year course there, you can show them the photograph and still they argue that it's not, not existent, even there's a tape measure there. And you're going, woo, woo. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, they, they were the ancient Britons, they were the Neolithic. Uh, Stonehenge is a Neolithic monument, and uh, it's now believed that when it was 2500 BC, thereabouts, but probably more the Chalcolithic uh, period, a little bit before, the Beaker people came over and they had already been moving from the Russian steppes. Uh, that's what the DNA is saying. And then you've got another migration from the Netherlands coming down here. These are the people here. Then they came uh, over to, to Great Britain. Would you offer an approximate height, in your opinion, of some of the, what might be referred to as you know, giants compared to us? The Bronze Age people that Colt Hoare spoke about as being tall, stout men from the bush barrow, the femur there was 20.5 inches. That femur was registered by Colt Hoare, and there's a very extensive online article about that, and he was six foot six. The other uh, tall people had uh, a roughly between that type, and you get a few others that are anomalies, uh, like that, but in the Neolithic they were all under 18 inches and after that they, they were uh, over that, although I've still got some to, to photograph, you know, uh, but they, they, a lot of them were recorded, I mean even from about 1850, especially they were better in the, in the York area for recording, they measured everything. Uh, Colt Hall would say, oh that's, tall, that's a tall person, tall stout, whereas in the north they would say we're going to measure it. So you get more accurate the more north that you go. But no, nonetheless, uh, they, they have been measured. And then you've got a place called Wood Yates, uh, which is Sixpenny Handley. There was a lot of tall people there. And there I'm, I'm going to photograph their femur bones uh, next Tuesday. And that's a stone throw from Knowlton, another Henderson. Yeah. Which is on chalk. Yeah, and same as Rudstone, that's on chalk uh, in, in York, uh, East Riding in Yorkshire, and that's where I found the most elongated skunk. And then they think they came down to Stonehenge. So in the Bronze Age, you had a lot of the, the, nor the northerners. <laughs> My mum's from the north, I can say that. Uh, she's from Newcastle. Uh, and sh they came down like that, tra trading jets. That was the bling of the, the Bronze Age. They loved black jewellery. It was exquisitely made as well. Black buttons as well. Beautiful black buttons. And, and some of their objects, I mean, this is an object that I found uh, recently. I was supposed to see a little traveller in Tesco. God love him. Uh, he works in Tesco. And I've always shown in my finds that... Um, I think the ancestors, whenever I want uh, the ancestors to say I'm on the right track, I ask for something. They've given me kind of my pre-Bronze Age money ring, and that's a Bronze Age axe. Uh, not axe, it's a spearhead that, uh, that I found recently. And they're exquisitely made. You know, this is four and a half thousand years old, but the edges are just, uh, they're perfect. And if you want to find artefacts, you never look at the barrows themselves because that's not where they shoved things quickly. When they wanted to kind of do um, offerings, uh, they put it uh, away from the barrow. So I find them in molehills 
that start kicking over molehills, they drag things up. And then you can have a good rummage around, uh, so to speak. But yeah, that's, that's my treasured one at the moment. 